Well, welcome to Garden Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're able to join us here today. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, God bless you. If you're able to be here in the sanctuary with us, or if you're listening to our radio station, God bless you. If you have your Bible, won't you open it to our New Testament lesson this morning? It comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. My Bible says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Won't you join with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The famous evangelist, Charles Stanley, when he was taking his final exams in seminary, recalls one specific exam that was especially difficult. And as he looked at the exam, he noticed in the lecture hall that there was a note at the top of the test that said, please read all of the questions before you begin the exam. And so as he began to thumb through the test, there was a stillness in the air. He could hear people tapping their pencil. He could hear other fellow seminarians breathing heavily as they read the questions, realizing that they were far more difficult than anything that they had studied for. And finally, when he got to the last page, at the very bottom, in fine print, it said, if you want a perfect score on this exam, all you need to do is sign your name. He looked around, and he saw fellow students already beginning to answer questions. He wondered, perhaps, they didn't read the entire exam. He saw a few students who were frustrated actually walked up and threw the test into the trash without signing it. Was it too good to be true that all he needed to do was sign his name? In faith, he chose to believe the message, and he signed his name at the bottom of the test, and he slowly walked up to turn in his exam. Days later, Stanley was relieved to find out that he got a perfect score on the exam, And the professor told him that he had used that test for years and years to illustrate the faith necessary to accept the matchless grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. You have to have faith that when your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, that it doesn't matter if you got all the questions right while you're here on earth. What matters is believing in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What matters is believing that God is for us. Who could be against us? Believing that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is in our corner. I imagine your picture is on God's refrigerator with a little heart drawn around it. If God had a heavenly car, I believe your face would be on his bumper sticker with a message that said, my kid made the honor roll. Because God is cheering for you. God is for you. 
God wants to prosper you. He wants to encourage you. When I think of people who are in our corner, who really want to encourage us to do our best, I'm reminded of the amazing story of the philanthropist Eugene Lang. On June 25th, 1981, Eugene Lang was invited to go back to his elementary school, East Harlem School 121. 53 years previously, he attended sixth grade there himself, and they asked him if he would come and give the graduation speech for sixth graders there. And as Eugene spoke, he was inspired by Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And so he began to encourage students to think about their dreams, to study hard, to fight for their dreams and to go to middle school and to go to high school because at that time in East Harlem, it had the highest dropout rate in the entire nation. And as Lang spoke to students about how he studied throughout middle school and how he stayed in high school and how he worked hard to get through college, he noticed that a lot of people were just tuning him out. A lot of students weren't even looking at him. And friends, having taught at Bridgeport Elementary sixth grade for many years and having passed out many awards during sixth grade graduations, I can relate to Eugene Lang. Sixth graders just want to start summer break. They just want to get through it. They could care less about the speeches. And it was in that moment that Eugene Lang, kind of on a whim, said, you know what, if you guys can just get accepted to a four-year college, I'll pay for your tuition. I'll pay for your college. I'll give you a scholarship. And before the words escaped his mouth, there was a hush in the room. Suddenly, people started to look up. And people started to cheer and clap. Parents started to run up on the stage. He was mobbed by students as he realized the brevity of what he had said. Soon after that speech, he started the I Have a Dream Foundation. And he e-marked $2,000 for each of those sixth grade students that he spoke to. And he said, I'm going to encourage you in high school. I'm going to set up special field trips for you to visit colleges. I'm going to hire tutors for you to make sure you get through high school. And I'm going to help you apply to colleges. And then he decided to hire tutors for them when they were in college. Because a lot of students get discouraged in college and drop out. He wanted to make sure that these students graduated in four years. The rest of the story is Eugene Lang died a few years ago at the age of 98. In his life, he gave away $150 million in tuition money and he helped 16,000 students graduate from college. I imagine those students felt like Eugene Lang was all about them. He was for them. He was encouraging them. He was supporting and helping them. How much more does it mean to you to know that God is for us? That God wants to encourage us? This morning, I want to talk about four specific ways that God is for each and every one of us. The first way that I believe God is tangibly for us is that he takes care of our physical needs. My Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Again, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 32, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. God is for us. He wants to help you with your sustenance, with food, with clothing. I believe this is why Jesus fed the 5,000. He wanted to illustrate how God cares about our physical needs. The second way that I believe God is for us is that he gives us rest. My Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 through 30, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
Again, the 23rd Psalm says in verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. God cares about your physical needs, but he also is for you in that he wants you to rest. And friends, when I'm trying to succeed on my own, and I'm trying to work and use my own abilities to prosper, that's when I get run down. That's when I get sick, and I find myself resting anyway. God wants us to find rest. God wants us to trust him. And as summer approaches, with this last week of school, I'm looking forward to sleeping past 4.15 a.m. and just getting a little bit of rest. The third way that God is for us is that he provides direction. My Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24, a man's steps are from the Lord. How then can man understand his way? Again, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Those good works were prepared beforehand. God is directing us. When I wake up in the morning, I imagine that I have a divine appointment with every student I meet because those meetings, those interactions, those were appointed by God before I was born. God had a plan. In 2000, I was a student at CSULA in Los Angeles. I was finishing my master's degree in education. And my wife and I were both teaching full-time for Pasadena Unified School District. We were looking at homes, old bungalows, whose porches were caved in, who looked like they should have been condemned just trying to find a home that we could afford. We couldn't afford anything in Southern California. And we wanted God to provide direction. Should we just stay in Pasadena and keep on teaching and just live in an apartment for the rest of our lives? Would we ever have a home of our own? And God provided direction. Mary's brother, John, was living in Fishers at the time. And he said, you know, you can afford a home as teachers in Indianapolis. You can afford milk and eggs if you move to Indianapolis. He said, I have a friend who works for Wayne Township. You should call. You should get an interview. They'd love to have Keith. And so I followed that direction. And between my classes at USCLA, I stood outside my class, and I had a phone interview. And I accepted a job at Wayne Township, having never seen the west side of Indianapolis, and never having had seen the school that I would teach in, because I really believed that God was providing me direction, that he was leading me here. And that's what brought me to each and every one of you. That's what brought me to the west side of Indianapolis, was trusting God's leading, because God is for us. God has a plan for your life. And that was some 20 years ago for me, 22 years ago. But I believed that God was directing me here. God is also for us in that he gives us matchless grace, amazing grace. My Bible says in the book of 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not of your own doing. It's a gift from God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. My Bible says if we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. My Bible says for God so loved the world, he gave his only son to die, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. My Bible says God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. God is for us. And that amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ reminds me of the story of Captain Smith of the Titanic. Many of you probably watched the movie. Between April 14th and 15th in 1912, the Titanic hit an iceberg. And it took over two hours, 40 minutes to sink. In the movie, you might recall the captain closing the bulk doors so that the boat would sink slower, giving people time to get on the life raft. 
But a famous historian, Tim Malton, in his book, Titanic, A Very Deceiving Night, has gone over so many eyewitness accounts and journal entries that he has a different story about the captain of the Titanic, Captain Smith. He says, quote, Smith actually took a header dive off the front of the wheelhouse into the sea and swam in Arctic waters around, helping people get into lifeboats. He was actually or offered a seat on a lifeboat, but refused to get on board because he was helping other people. God is giving you a seat on his lifeboat this morning. It may seem too good to be true, but believing that it is true is exactly what we must do because that's what faith is all about. Believing that God is for us. Believing that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. If that's your prayer today to believe that God cares about your physical needs, if it's your prayer today to believe that God wants to give you direction, that God wants to shower you with grace, that God wants to direct your paths, then won't you join us as Marie comes up to play Like a River Glorious on page 494.